Good afternoon. I'm very, very pleased to present this, this award, and I might just make a couple statements about it. The empirical scientific method is one of the, the few crown jewels of Western civilization. And it is now under assault by the academies that have evolved it. It is a very startling turn, I think, in this. Um, and it is either tolerated um, or encouraged by the highest levels of, of our government. A very, I think, a very grave moment for us. As I'm sure everyone in here knows and knows better than I, uh, a theory or a hypothesis remains an idea until validated and or confirmed by physical evidence, observational evidence. We know who the deniers are. I don't need to explain that. The deniers of the integrity of that method and what it means from the standpoint of, the, of the, what the genuine scientific method, what it, what it means to assess the strength or weakness, the validity of a hypothesis. Um, if in, I believe it is so grave that if we lose throughout our universities and in, um, and in government application of, of science, if we lose the crown jewel and respect it as such as the empirical scientific method, we lose some of the other crown jewels. Freedom, innovation. Um, we, we lose the wellsprings of what has been the most vast um, increase in global income per capita in the last 50, you can say 200, but the last 50 years is really amazing. Um, has made possible statements like this from the United Nations in some of their, their more insightful moments um, that world poverty was reduced more in the, in the last 50 years than in the last 500. So the stakes are very high. And the extent of the witch hunts um, to um, ostracize or harm, professionally harm, those valiant scientists that have, that have um, stood up for the integrity of this scientific method, um, um, they cannot be thanked enough. And one of those is today is the recipient um, of this award, David Legates. He is a professor of, yes. Where is he? <laughs> He is professor of climatology at the University of Delaware College of Earth, Ocean, and Environment, where his specialty is hydroclimatology, precipitation, and climate change, and computational methods, all of which is so, so at, at the core of um, meaningful climate science. Um, he was former, um, me, um, yeah, the Delaware State Meteorologist, has won many awards, hundreds of, of papers, and he, um, the, I believe, if I understand correctly, David, um, the university thought maybe they could run you off. And that would be a light way to put it, I, to, to withstand, um, again, that those sort of F witch hunts as David has, and to remain in place and to keep going and contributing um, is, is an expression of, of great courage in defense of true science. I'm very happy for you to come up and receive the, oh, there's the award. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very honored and humbled at this award. I, and I must admit, I'm, I'm very uh, embarrassed. This is not like the Lifetime Achievement Award or for something you've actually done throughout the long course of your career. It's essentially, you've been beaten over the head by a bunch of thugs and uh, repeatedly, and you persevered. And in a sense, everyone in this room, if they've ever spoken out, has experienced what it's like to be beaten over the head by a bunch of thugs and you've persevered. So in a sense, this is all your award, and I am just happen to be the person up here making the speech. So thank you.
first of all, let me thank Joe Bass and the Heartland Institute, for not just for their generosity, but for essentially everything they do. Um, I would have known two-thirds, three-quarters of you had it not been for these meetings, and they have been instrumental in keeping the concept of climate change in the forefront of people's minds, and I just simply thinking it's something that um, is, is a foregone conclusion of, of anthropogenic climate change. And for that, I'm, I'm very truly pleased at what they do. Thank you. I also want to thank Ms. Kathleen Hartnett White for her kind words and um, the Texas Public Policy Foundation for their generosity. I also want to thank them for not holding against me the fact that I did live a decade in Oklahoma. <laughs> Oklahomans and Texans don't quite always get along, and I hope Senator Imhoff is not in the room, but I want to say I am not an Okie. Um, as the OU fight song says, they're sooner born, they're sooner bred, and when they're gone, they'll be sooner dead. <laughs> I wish to dedicate this award actually to my mother. Um, she and I celebrate her 89th birthday on Sunday, um, and she's essentially taught me to be a fighter. She in particular uh, in the 1960s was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. In late 1970s, uh, she was probably the first, one of the first people in the state of Delaware to get a permanent implanted pacemaker. She has conquered skin cancer, um, breast cancer twice, colon cancer. Uh, she's worn out a knee. And um, in particular, um, this past January of 2014, she broke her leg uh, while out taking weather observations for me. <laughs> so again, I wish she could be here so you could all meet her, but thanks, Mom. I also want to thank two other people who have been sort of inspirations going through this. Um, first is my good friend, Willie Soon. Uh, Willie has put up with more abuse than about a hundred people should ever have to put up with in our lifetime. And he's done it with a smile on his face and a spring in his step. And I can tell you I've met his two boys and as long as they're around, Willie's spirit will always go on. The other person who's been working with me on this has been Jan Blitz at the University of Delaware. Uh, he is part of the uh, Delaware ch chapter of the National Association of Scholars, NAS, which is the good NAS, I might add, not the uh, other one. Um, they are actually here too, and so make sure you stop by their booth and make sure if you don't know who they are, that before you leave, you figure out who they are. So thank you, Jan. I want to tell you a story about a public school teacher that had actually un unwittingly a very important influence on my life. Um, it was eighth grade science class, and to be honest with you, I had no idea what we covered in that class. Uh, it was that unmemorable, uh, except I do remember one incident. We spent about three weeks talking about um, a new book. We were reading it and going through it and discussing it. It was going to change the face of science. Um, it would never again see the world in the same way. It essentially was the in, an inconvenient truth of its time. Essentially, the book laid out irrefutable and convincing evidence that scientific and technological advancements occurred historically as a direct result of the intervention of aliens from outer space. <laughs> you probably know the book. It was Chariots of the Gods by Eric Von Daniken. You can still see him on TV quite often uh, on something, the Science Channel, Discovery Channel, uh, the Smithsonian Channel. Sorry, Willie. Uh, places where you'd never see a discussion of climate change, but where you can learn all about space aliens and how they visit the planet Earth. Um, but to an impressionable group of eighth graders who really don't know the difference between fantasy and fiction, um, fantasy and fact, I should say, the book is likely to have a profound effect on our future, and it probably would on me too, except for one thing, and that is I came across another book called Crash Go the Chariots. And if you've ever read that book, it illustrates point by point how Don Daniken's work is misguided, incorrect, deceptive, or in some cases just plain fraudulent. I remember giving the book to the teacher and he looked at it over the weekend and he came back Monday morning and he walked up to me and he took the book and he dropped it on the desk in front of me and essentially said something to the effect of standard skeptic crap. <laughs> Which which essentially was very prophetic because in about 32 years later, on the pages of the journal Science, my research would be characterized by those exact same three words. 
trust me, if Science Magazine ever writes your research is standard skeptic crap, you can pretty much guarantee you've ticked off somebody. And let me say to those people, it didn't stop me then, and it ain't going to stop me now. But what I learned from that is essentially that science isn't simply drawing inferences from data, that it involves conflict, disagreement, misunderstanding, dead ends, and a trial by fire of defending your ideas in the marketplace of scientific inquiry. I once had a talented undergraduate student who decided not to go into graduate school, and the reason he said to me was because science for him was just too uncertain. <laughs> you know, I wouldn't be interested in science if the answers came easily. But one of the two things I've learned through all this in particular is who your friends are, and importantly, who your friends aren't. I've had a number of friends who disagree with me strongly on the, I, my views on climate change, but they will defend that I have the right to say it, and some have even withdrawn or, or left certain organizations because they refuse to have me speak. Um, on the other hand, I have people that I thought were my friends, and in fact, some of them said, uh, essentially, I do really secretly agree with you, you know, this, this climate change stuff, anthropogenic climate change is really overblown and I really don't see it, except when the chips were down, they have effectively joined in, um, joined the other side. Um, and in a sense, what I've learned is that their main goal in life is really to be loved by everyone, particularly those in authority and power. I'm pleased to say I know a number of you in the room and I'm pleased to an honor to be able to call you friends. And in particular, I want to thank again the Heartland Institute for all they've done, the Texas Public Policy Foundation for their generous award, and again, all of you for being who you are. Thank you.